It's just my passwords. It's not nearly as cool as the. Yeah. yeah, we're good. Does this work? Velcro? Yeah. Grow cough. Yeah. Isn't that working? Yeah, we're good. Yeah, we're good. Let's do it. All right. Good evening, good evening everyone. Welcome. Quick administrative announcement that this is the last uh, seminar of the semester. There's no seminar next week, so do not come to class next week. Or actually, you're welcome to come, but no one else will be here. So uh, this will be our thriving highlight to end the, the whole series of the semester. I want to introduce my friend, Matt Grokoff, who flew in from Ann Arbor, Michigan, to join us for this. He's a net Boy, zero. my arm's tired. Yeah, but I was like, such a boy. My son, 11-year-old son, is auditioning to be MC for the talent show, and I told him to use that joke. Sort of, I just flew in, and boy, my arm's tired. So he will be talking about a lot of his efforts on net zero homes uh, from a couple different perspectives. You might have seen him on TV. He's been a talking head in a variety of ways and has a lot of interesting projects. So I'll let you sort of introduce yourself more fully through your projects as yeah, we walk us through. Yeah. And he prefers questions at the end, so we'll let him get through, and then we'll go to questions after that, and then we'll go to Schultz, Schultz the Beer Garden after that's all done. Sounds, Sounds good. good. Okay, great. Thanks. You guys want to let go now? Yeah, we could. Yeah, the sooner you end, the sooner we go. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I, I'm the least interesting part of this talk. So um, uh, let, let's just get right to it. So I, uh, this is this is really about redesigning civilization. But I want to put all of this into into perspective. This is one of my favorite photographs of all time. Uh, probably just after the Earthrise photograph that was taken in 1972. Um, uh, this is from the Cassini spacecraft in 2013, uh, just just west of Saturn. And uh, if you look, what's gorgeous about this picture is not just the rings of Saturn, but right over there in the corner where that little arrow is, if you look really, really closely, that's, um, that, that's uh, Austin, Texas right there. Uh, just above that, a little north, there's Ann Arbor, where I flew in from. That little pale blue dot is where all of civilization has taken place. It's where every war has taken place, every act of kindness on this little, what Carl Sagan called, that pale blue dot. So when you think about things, I, I was actually just reading um, a fabulous new book called Sapiens. If you, have anybody heard of this book? I just heard of it and read it this week. It's amazing, fabulous. Get this book. Uh, it, um, I, it, it really puts into perspective the population growth and things that we've had. So I just started realizing that, that the entire Egyptian kingdom had about the same population as Austin, Texas. So the entire Egyptian empire at its largest. So when you think about that, Steve Adler actually represents uh, uh, just as many people as Pharaoh did, right? Uh, we, we've really kind of disturbed the, the way we've done things over the past uh, 200 years since the Industrial Revolution as things have started to grow. We need to go back to designing things like an old growth forest. Because an old growth forest has a complexity and a resiliency, not like tree farms, which is this top-down linear process that when you check boxes, looks like it's a really successful system. But it's actually a linear, fractal, critical system that is uh, constantly needing external inputs. Where, where a complex system is where biodiversity and uh, uh, th th that's a symptom of health. It's an indicator of health. Whereas simplicity is an indicator of decline. Simplicity eventually always collapses in nature when things become oversimplified. So we've got this idea, right, where everything in nature is this really adjacent thing, where we, we've got like architects, again, because we've created these little boxes that are not networked with each other, that appear to be very, very successful through our narrow lens of time. That's Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, uh, Carlos Roddy at uh, MIT said that he was asked this question, uh, if you could redesign a city, how would you do it? And he said, I, I wouldn't, because cities are the result of this bottom-up process ever since they, they started appearing about 10,000 years ago. It's this collaborative, bottom-up, very adjacent process in the same way that nature does. 
This is a slide that I actually put together before I gave a, a talk in Verona. So I took the, I went, found this uh, gorgeous uh, um, uh, old map of uh, Verona, only to realize five minutes before my talk that that's actually Venice. But the point's the same. <laughs> and I, I literally put this together like five minutes before my talk. And when I stuck these two images side by side, the longer you look at this, the more beautiful and fascinating it is. Because it actually has the same fractal math the same repeating patterns at varying degrees of magnification that systems in nature have, that organic systems in nature. And why is that? Because before the Industrial Revolution, before we had Google Satellite Map, before we had cranes that could move things, before we had ships and, and trains that could ship large, heavy objects, what we had was our own two eyes at Google Street View only with our hands that we could lift a rock and put it here. And if the land went like this, we couldn't regrade that land, we went with that land. And if the river turned, you turned with it. And at that first flood, because you didn't have civil engineers to, to, to disturb that fractal nature of that river, you were instantly corrected and never made that same mistake again. But as soon as we have the Industrial Revolution, we start creating these, these, uh, these uh, little boxes. Um, now, so let me just take a little diversion. This is, this is my house, right? This is in 2006, uh, right at the peak of the uh, uh, housing market, uh, we thought this is the perfect time to buy a house, right? Google's coming to Ann Arbor, the house is gonna go through the roof. We found this house, asbestos siding, uh, no insulation anywhere in the house except for this layer of newspaper dated 1901 in the attic. We had uh, lead paint throughout the house. We had uh, windows, the original single pane windows that didn't even open. They were inoperable, but air flowed through them. You could stick a spatula through them. We had carpet over heart pine floors from trees that were growing at the time Columbus sailed for America. We had refrigerator from 1989. We had toilets that were five gallons per flush. We had uh, genuine Formica. This was the only real thing in the house was the genuine Formica uh, and the pink towel curtains in the back. And you notice there's no shower either. There was no shower in the house, just this bathtub from 1969. We still have the receipt. She kept everything. Um, uh, we had a Mueller Climatrol furnace from 1959 that was never going to die. It cost us about $300 a month to run that in the wintertime. And for that privilege, we had to sleep in full dress town gear with, with, with uh, sweatpants, sweatshirts, and a buckwheat pillow heated up in the microwave and shoved at the bottom of the bed in order to stay, stay, stay comfortable. And for that privilege, we got to pay the utility company 300 bucks a month. But when we bought the house, we had this mission. We called it Mission Zero after Ray Anderson from Interface Carpet, who was going to take his Fortune 500 multinational corporation and make it uh, the first regenerative corporation. And they're actually on target to do that pretty soon. Um, and I figured if he can do that, why can't I do this in an old house? Totally ignorant. I'm not an engineer. I'm not an architect. Um, I'm not an urban planner. But if you can do it with that, why can't I do it with this home? So out of complete ignorance, we said we're going to make this house harvest all of its own energy that it needs. We're going to harvest all our own water that we need. We're going to create no waste. Any, anything, any byproduct that comes off of this house is going to be some way beneficial to the ecosystem surrounding us. We will return more ecosystem services than we take from it. So this was the house in uh, 1913. Uh, that's Gert's older brother. We bought the house from Gert, um, in, uh, who was born in the house in, the, in our parlor in 1920. Uh, that was the house the day we bought it with the plywood front porch and the asbestos siding and the antenna on the roof. We won all kinds of preservation awards. We've now achieved net zero, uh, net zero energy and certified through the International Living Future Institute. Yeah. Um, this was uh, a couple of years ago on the first day of spring. We brought our new daughter, Dahlia, home from the hospital and we had a check in the mailbox from our utility company. So it's, um, it's pretty cool. We just got the, uh, another one for this year a few days ago. My, uh, my mother-in-law calls her the, uh, the net zero baby because when we crossed over the threshold, I almost had tears in my eyes thinking this is the first child, one of the first of a generation that will grow up never knowing what it's like to grow up in a carbon consuming home. That's pretty damn cool. So we started, so through all of this work, I started getting lots of attention being asked to speak all around the world and I started a consulting company. I've been in USA Today and Fox and uh, everywhere. I was called the number one electric innovator, the proven zero energy master. That's, I make my wife call me that sometimes. Um, uh, and uh, my Ford magazine put us literally in the centerfold, and uh, we were the all-electric family. And um, uh, they brought their prototype electric vehicle. And I said, hey, can I drive that? They said no. So I said, screw you, and bought a Chevy Volt. Um, <laughs> the Tesla's coming in the fall, the, the cheap one. 
um, uh, and uh, best green homes in USA Today, and uh, this was my favorite. I had to keep this in there. We got an award for being aware of the environment. <laughs> Uh, they're giving they're giving awards for this now. This, um, uh, but this was the this was the most flattering of all. Was the Atlantic called a sustainable perfection? But the reality is that that's um, it's kind of bullshit. There's no such thing as a sustainable building. In fact, there's no such thing as a sustainable anything in nature as an individual because all of life is sustained by these underlying networks. Nature doesn't do off-grid. For a while, if you Googled off-grid, I came up as one of the first three hits, and I could not figure out why. Everyone's thinking that uh, we're not off-grid. Um, in fact, nature does on network in a beautifully elegant way. It's complex. It's diverse. Uh, it's resilient. Um, nature makes all of the rules for what a healthy system is. And it's had 3.8 billion years to kind of figure this out. Every organism working in in, uh, in concert to make this happen. Uh, just a couple quick examples. The uh, great white shark has had 350 million years to come up with a mechanism that makes sure that it can go very, very slowly without any bacteria or growth uh, growing up on its scales. The skin looks incredibly smooth, but when you look through an electron microscope, you see that it's actually these rough denticles that are perfectly matched just so that a piece of bacteria will not be able to grow on that uh, and other things. So they're not growing barnacles in the way a gray whale might with a completely different skin structure over 350 million years. Uh, mangroves have developed a mechanism where they can filter fresh water from salt water uh, through just a different kind of cellular structure in the way that the leaves work, 114 million years to do that. Now humans, on the other hand, we've, um, we haven't had as long to come up with some of these things. We've only been doing this for about uh, 70,000 years or so since the cognitive revolution. Um, uh, so uh, Benoit Mendelbrot said that, you know, so, so how do we design these things? How do you design a tree, right? He said, think not of what you see, but what it took to produce what you see. And Benoit Mendelbrot, uh, it was the uh, father of fractal geometry. He actually coined the term um, so how do you design a tree? Uh, you don't. You, it, it, it emerges from the bottom up um, through a series of experimentation and repetition and iteration over and over again. Um, but it follows very, very simple rules for the way things interact at the local level, the way the wind blows, the way water flows, the way a cell divides, the way branching laws work. Um, and those patterns are the same everywhere in the universe. These things just kept repeating, and the math is very, very similar. And they're absolutely beautiful as well. And they have what we call the golden ratio in this range. Um, the spiral of a rose is the same as the spiral of a hurricane or a spiral of the universe. And it's kind of mind blowing when you think about these things. So complexity is really very simple when you think about it. Or maybe better said is that complexity is built on these simple rules for local interaction. So this is a, a swarm of starlings. Uh, it's called a murmuration. And this is gorgeous stuff. When I first showed this to my wife, she thought that this was a digital enhancement. And there's no leader in this group. There's no uh, uh, com you know, complicated set of rules. There's no top-down management system. And yet they, they form these extraordinary patterns based on three simple rules. Stay near your neighbor. Not too close, don't touch your neighbor, don't collide into your neighbor, and turn in the direction that your neighbor's turning. That's it, three rules. You can actually plug these, that, those same rules into a computer just using dots, and they will create the identical patterns to this. It will look very, very similar. And the patterns are repeating, or are similar, but they never actually repeat, and it's pretty gorgeous. Um, but what we do is we think very individually, very linearly. So uh, last year was the anniversary of the stoplight. The first thing we did was red, red, green. That was it. There was no yellow in between. So we were a little less linear than we used to be. But these traffic lights are still the same thing. It's like very, very linear. Stop, go, stop, go. Um, in, uh, in, in the natural world, you've got these swarms of things. You've got ants. This is a, a, a real scientific video, but you get kind of the picture. There's no traffic in nature. Um, And 
and as it turns out, we're able to take the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the mathematics of how ants do that and create algorithms. Uh, there's ant algorithms, bee algorithms, starling swarm algorithms. Um, uh, this is, again, uh, oops, it doesn't work on that. It's um, uh, out of MIT, they created an algorithm for autonomous vehicles and how they might be able to elim completely eliminate the traffic signal. So it no longer is a, a linear process, it's a complex, um, where is it? And so again, stop, go, stop, go. With this, they, they behave the same way that the ants move. And so pedestrians can flow and cars can flow without ever having to stop. And they're actually traveling at a slower speed but arriving at their destination quicker and with greater optimization, even if it's less efficient, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, and uh, so I call this the the, uh, the Goldberg Goldberger paradox. So um, uh, uh, Rube Goldberg was the guy who created um, he's complicated. He was actually an engineer and uh, also an artist on the side and quit his job as an engineer because he was starting to engineer at a time where people were just trying to cram human engineering across this fractal pattern in nature without working with it. There was actually a book. Uh, uh, oh, I forgot his name, Siegfried somebody, um, called Mechanization Takes Command, where you didn't have to, we were just talking about this, right? In, in Austin, Texas, we, don't, we just does build a courtyard in the 1960s, it just close everything in so it bakes, and we'll just force feed air conditioning in there to cool everybody off. You don't need to pay attention to where the breezes are coming from. So he mocked this kind of linear, fractal, critical engineering with these incredible things where if any part of it failed, the entire system would fail. Whereas Ari Goldberger, uh, is a cardiologist at Harvard University. And he actually discovered that there were mathematical patterns to the rhythm of the heartbeat that were indicators of whether a heart had, um, a, was a diseased heart or was a healthy heart. And what he found was the more complex the pattern, the variation in the pattern, um, uh, was an indicator of health. And the more simplified it was, was an indicator of disease. Simplicity was an indicator of disease. So he showed this to a group of, uh, of medical professionals and realized that most of them picked the wrong ones. So if they picked this one down here, that was atrial fibrillation, right? It was complete erraticism. There's no pattern in there. So you plug this into the computer, it's not finding any repeatable pattern in here. Um, but it's going crazy. This guy's about to have a heart attack. These other two are incredibly simplified and they're they're much more but um but um but um but um, which seems like it might be something very healthy, but it's so oversimplified. It's actually con uh, congestive heart failure, severe congestive heart failure. And when you think about what's the uh, simplest form of an EKG, it's a flat line. It's death. So the simpler you go, the closer you are to death and collapse into eventually to death. And then this is the one that's a healthy heart. So um, and again, it's fractal. You go three minutes, thirty minutes, and the patterns repeat in the same way in the same branching mechanisms and things in the same patterns. Uh, that the other things. And interestingly enough, um, I, I just found this uh, pretty recently that uh, last year there was a journal uh, in the British Journal of Medicine, 160,000 blood samples, blood, blood pressure samples, and they found that um, the ones that had a, a, a fractal math of 1.618, which is coincidentally, not so coincidentally, the golden ratio, um, uh, those people were less likely to have heart attacks. Uh, if you had a 1.7, I forgot what the number was, something, uh, uh, actually, they went back and they looked at everyone who had a heart attack. All of them had somewhere in the range of 1.7. So they were way above this or way below this number. Um, so nature has this very simple performance code. So his son, Ari Goldberger's son, is a, a, also a cardiologist and a jazz musician. So he got together with a bunch of folks and decided to, uh, through the computer, um, put these different patterns that his father's samples were showing um, to music and let the computer create the music based on these patterns. And so we'll play a couple of these here and you'll see which ones. Um so there it is, A, dance-like plasticity, patterns that don't exactly repeat, so there's variation, and this is let's just uh, plastic, beautiful, elegant dance between variation and pattern. Um, B has this over-repetition that if you listen to it for a while, you're, you're going to shoot yourself before you ever get to heart failure. 
so, so our systems now, we're designing all of these things from Google Satellite Map. Flint just recently had their water crisis, and to fix the water crisis, what are they going to do? They're going to just replace all the pipes with the same fracture critical linear system, top down, pulling from a distant source, pumping it into the city with great force and energy, and then delivering it through all things. But again, if it's not lead, next time it's going to be um, E. coli, or it's going to be Legionnaires, or it's going to be um, uh, just a broken water pipe where the water can't be delivered. Um, or, or, uh, and uh, so energy, water, food systems all become incredibly linear systems. So what we need to do is decentralize all of these systems and put and replace them with these natural patterns. So um, uh, in, the, in the current system, you've got uh, centralized power, right? You, you harvest it from one central source. You ship it to, uh, to a centralized power plant. You force burn it, and you force that electricity through a single, a single line uh, that goes to everyone's home. And now everyone's concerned with the system because it's very vulnerable to terrorism. Um, the reality is terrorists have never, uh, 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 never actually threatened our power grid. Um, there's no evidence of it anyway. The real threats are squirrels, right? And there's, there's a real thing, actually. It's called um, uh, POCBS. You can Google this. I swear it's true. It's a uh, power outage caused by squirrels. Uh, because of this fracture, and it's, it could be squirrels, it could be wind. Uh, a few weeks ago in uh, Michigan, um, there, uh, they, uh, DTE and uh, Consumers Energy reported that they had one million customers out. And customers actually a meter. It could be five, six people behind every one of those meters. But a million customers were out for eight days in Michigan because of a windstorm on a perfectly sunny day. Um, and they blamed the wind, not their system. So Tony Seba says that right now we've got this centralized model that's 100 years old and completely outmoded where it's big banks financing big energy with uh, big power plants in just a few places. Again, there's no good examples of healthy systems in nature that operate this way. So what we need to do is have these systems that are, um, uh, that are more distributed, that are um, less fracture critical, that everyone is financing, that is, um, you're harvesting energy where it's done, you're on a microgrid that's resilient. If uh, things around you go down, you can operate in emergency mode and continue going. You can share with the others that are connected into your network that might also um, have some level of res res resilience, and you might even be able to provide some backup power to some of those areas that have had, that have had seri serious uh, um, uh, infrastructure problems. So you have this internet of energy uh, with this series of uh, uh, interconnected microgrids. Water, same thing. We can decentralize the water system. This is one of the most difficult things uh, because we don't see water, uh, the water infrastructure, the way we do. Uh, it's about 100 years old. It's underneath. Uh, Ann Arbor has creeks all over the place. Not one of them is above ground. They're all buried in pipes. Um, we've had multiple uh, sewer overflows all over the city of Ann Arbor. But, you know, if you don't read the news or you haven't uh, did not walk through a neighborhood that smells like crap, you didn't notice. Um, uh, and that's where the good water system so we basically, every one of these systems, whether it's Paris, London, Austin, Texas, Ann Arbor, Michigan, has functionally three pipes, right? We've got fresh water coming in in Ann Arbor. We pull it up from the Huron River. We pipe it up, up a hill with great energy expense. We treat it with all kinds of chemicals. We pipe it back down the hill or through gravity. Uh, everyone uses it coming out of that one singular fresh water pipe, and it's all fresh water. It's all treated water. We use it for a singular purpose. Again, not distributed, not, not complex. And uh, then we poop in it, we pee in it, we put our tampons in it, we put our estrogen in it, and, uh, and then we put it back into a second pipe. And we send that further down river, and, uh, where it leaks and overflows and does all kinds of other stuff. And then we discharge it clean back into that river source, sometimes. There's not one in the United States that has a, had a perfect record. Um, they all overflow at some point with raw sewage. Uh, and then we have a tertiary pipe, which is um, stormwater, right? We talk about these apocalyptic terms rather than rain, which is supposed to be an asset. We pave everything over. We just build in. We just engineer pipes. Some places have combined sewer overflows. So we've, you've got, uh, you know, in, in the average house, 100 gallons per person per day coming in clean polluted water going out, and all the rain that hits the property is completely unused and, uh, and, is, uh, and is a burden rather than asset to that building and the people within it. So whereas a, uh, a, so a centralized system, this is what it looks like. This is uh, a couple of years ago in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. 
That's Grand Rapids, Michigan on climate change. They were telling people, please don't kayak in the streets. And everyone thought, well, it's, oh, it's safe to kayak. I'm not going to drown. It's like, it's not the drowning we're worried about. It's what you're kayaking in. Um, and uh, it, again, it's an ingenious system. It works when it works, but it's oversimplified. And um, uh, you've got all of these issues with uh, that this is a human right. This is something that's, um, we, we haven't really thought about. What are we going to do? Even Ann Arbor, which has a good water system, 80% of the, of the pipes underground are going to need to be, are, are more than 75 years old, and they're going to need to be replaced within, in the best case scenario, within 30 years. There's no plan whatsoever about how to replace those over those 30 year period. And if the city grows, what do we do then? Whereas distributed systems can shrink and scale to whatever size is needed um, almost on a daily basis, but certainly over decades. Uh, whereas the linear system, the centralized system, we just keep adding pipes, which just increases the risk of failure. Um, this is Flint, Michigan. That was the actual water people were taking out of their taps. Uh, this is uh, Brazil. Um, I just uh, gave a talk down there last year, um, and I was shocked to learn that um, Sao Paulo, which is uh, right at the base of the rainforest, which gets heavy rains quite often and kind of this mist that, that comes in and keeps it well watered, um, it doesn't rain there anymore. <laughs> and their aquifer is drying up. So not only do they have one of the largest cities on the planet, but they're having less and less water because their water tank, which is the clouds above the uh, Amazon rainforest, are, are shrinking because the forest itself is shrinking. And um, this is what a fractal watershed looks like. That's the Amazon River Basin. So again, it's like the, uh, the neurons in your brain, the river, system, the, the river systems uh, anywhere in the world, the capillaries in your lungs all have these same branching laws. And it's absolutely beautiful. So what we're doing, uh, this is a building we were working on in uh, downtown Ann Arbor. This is what code says we're supposed to do. Um, and then when we looked at how we wanted to run the water and reuse it, harvest it from the sky, reuse it inside uh, for different purposes, uh, dirty water for toilets, um, reuse water that can be reused and little tiny bit for drinking. There's not that much that we actually need for drinking and this is what that looks like. So you go from this system to this system. It's a lot more complex and yet this one is more complicated and there's a difference. Um, so what we're doing at our house is just showing that there are different technologies and use simple off the shelf stuff. So we're working at the College of Engineering. I, I don't recommend you try this at home because um, you see my yard. Um, uh, so we're putting in a couple of these tanks. Um, if you look off, actually, this is kind of cool, because right over here in the corner, that's actually our original cistern that we knew was somewhere in that area. So when the house was built in 1901, it was net positive water. It harvested the water it needed from the sky. It pulled up clean water from, uh, from a well, uh, and the little bit that they needed, they just hand pumped. Um, uh, and that's the filtration system, simple off-the-shelf technology with a UV filter at the end. Uh, I told the students, follow the raindrop. Take that raindrop from the sky. If there was no, no place, if there was no building here, where would it go? Let's keep that model. Now let's plug ourselves into it. And can we harvest that water, treat it, use it, reuse it, harvest the nutrient wastes, and then return the clean water back into the aquifer where it would have gone before the house was even there? and we're proving it's possible because it is. Um, and it's pretty darn simple. So the living building challenge talks about this in a, uh, in a really uh, elegant way with uh, the metaphor of a flower. So basically the building is a lot like a flower. Um, uh, the flower harvests its own water. Uh, it can't go across the street for a drink. Um, it's adapted to sight, right? A dandelion can't inform a saguaro cactus and yet they're both successful organisms for the places that they grow. Um, uh, not one strategy is better than the other. Uh, it promotes well-being for things around it because it's, got a, it's part of an integrated system. Um, and most of all, it's beautiful. So buildings should be operating, and, and cities and neighborhoods should be operating the same way. So we're actually proposing this 150-home um, uh, uh, project in Ann Arbor. Um, we should know pretty soon, actually. We have a hearing next week uh, with the county. This is county-owned land. And the next bidders are offering $2 million more for the land than we are. And we just did some carbon math the other day and found that um, by the 2050 Paris targets, that any one of the other developers um, at, a, at a just simple carbon cost, forget about all the other benefits, um, would be three times more than what the difference in offer price is. So in other words, almost $7 million in carbon costs just in the electricity that they'll use. That doesn't include sequestration, it doesn't include transportation, it doesn't include water, 
um, well-being, um, all, all of the other things. So uh, simple things like that, whereas uh, uh, we need to be getting not just to zero, zero is not enough, we need to find ways to create beneficial neighborhoods. How do you send back more ecosystem services than you're using? When you're taking into account, uh, this is what ours will look like. Um, so uh, not just is it um, uh, uh, you know, harvesting its own energy and water and managing its own waste and things like that, but it's also beneficial to the, to the, to the soul. Um, it's very social. 33% uh, of it is affordable housing, uh, under 30% of the area median income. Um, uh, another 20% uh, is actually luxury housing. So you're combining every level of income into a 150 unit neighborhood with very little differentiation of what they look like from the outside. But then even, but everything from the microbes in the soil to the raindrop in the sky, we're, we're, we're working with that engineering. So the, the grass that you'll see will have, may have 18 foot roots in them, which is a, you know, sequesters carbon, uh, loosens the soil. It, it allows rainfall to go back into the soil rather than flooding the neighborhood next door. So all of these things are thought about. Um, we have uh, you know, uh, you know, affordable housing. That's actually actual habitat houses that our architects did. Um, uh, edible landscape. This is actually one of the coolest things. You can ask people in Michigan about a pawpaw uh, and most of them have never heard of this tree. It's actually a native tree to Michigan. I think Missouri and a couple of other places have these trees. And it actually has a fruit that's almost just like a papaya, uh, about this big, and has this creamy, unbelievable texture. You'll never find it in a grocery store because it's on the shelf. It's got a shelf life for about 24 hours. So you've got to pick it just before the squirrels eat it and, um, and eat it that day or turn it into ice cream. Um, but uh, it doesn't make good jam or anything else. But it's a beautiful tree. Uh, it, 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 uh, it, it hosts all kinds of insects. It sequesters carbon. Um, it's, it's adapted to, uh, to Michigan. Um, so all of these things. And this is, um, uh, and even integrating the food cycle. So this is gonna be our, our farm stop, modeled after a local place called Argus Farm Stop, which uh, gives uh, 80 cents on the dollar to farmers who drop things off seven days a week um, and this little, it's an old two-bay gas station that was turned into a seven-day-a-week grocery store. But the groceries are 100% all local, 177 different farmers. Talk about complexity. 177 farmers in the area of about 1,000 square feet, a fraction. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not as big as the olive counter at, at, uh, at Whole Foods. And yet, it's got 177 different farmers with fresh produce in the state of Michigan all year long, cheeses, meats, milk yogurt, uh, you name it, blue cheese, everything, all from within a couple hundred miles of the site at most. Uh, and um, uh, they, br they, they delivered over a million dollars in that little place to local farmers last year. Uh, every one of these that gets replicated in a different neighborhood is forecast to do another million dollars, uh, increasing the demand for local food, lowering the energy distribution cost and raising the value for the entire community. Um, and, it's a, and it's a community center. So that's my daughter and her friends because we, they, we go there all the time after school. We play, we do all kinds of things. So energy, water, food, all of these things have to be considered in these things. And we have to look at these things and think of like, what is the, um, the urgency? You knew this was coming because we haven't talked about climate change. So before the Industrial Revolution, just everybody's heard these numbers, but it's worth repeating. Um, before the Industrial Revolution, we were kind of stable at 290 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, and then James Hansen said, if we want to maintain the planet and the ecosystem that we ad adapted to, that we evolved with, and that all of other the living things on the planet evolved with, we want to hang on to that, we've got to stay below 350. And then along came Al Gore, that's 11 years ago now, and he shocked the hell out of us and told us we're at 381 parts per million. And everyone cried in the theater. And Paris Accord said, hey, look, our target should be 1.5 degrees, but if we want to stay below a catastrophic 2 degrees Celsius, we got to keep this below 450 parts per million to avoid those catastrophic things. I just pulled this number off a couple of hours ago. That's today's number from the Keeling Curve. That's from the Mauna Loa Laboratories in Hawaii. That's today. Um, it'll go down in the summer as we get more foliage growing on the northern hemisphere, but it'll come back up again. We've crossed that 410. Um, my uh, three-year-old daughter will be 23 years old 
when we cross that 450 target. If we don't start to stop carbon emissions as soon as possible and then begin to draw down because stopping them is not enough. We've got to turn the car around. So every living system is in decline. We're losing that biodiversity that is an indicator of a healthy system. And we all know this. So this is um, uh, the Philippine delegation from uh, the Doha talks in 2012. That day, uh, Hurricane Bopa, it was the worst storm, the worst typhoon ever to hit the island. And um, his family was impacted by this while he was at this climate conference where everybody was twiddling their thumbs. And this is what he had to say then. An important backdrop for my delegation is the profound impacts of climate change that we are already confronting. And as we sit here every single hour, even as we vacillate and procrastinate here, we are suffering. Madam Chair, we have never had a typhoon like Bopa, which has wreaked havoc in a part of the country that has never seen a storm like this in half a century. Finally, Madam Chair, I'm making an urgent appeal, not as a negotiator, not as a leader of my delegation, but as a Filipino. I appeal to the whole world. I appeal to the leaders from all over the world to open our eyes to the stark reality that we face. I appeal to ministers. The outcome of our work is not about what our political masters want. It is about what is demanded of us by seven billion people. I appeal to all, please no more delays, no more excuses. Please let Doha be remembered as the place where we found the political will to turn things around. And as you all might remember, in 2013, he went to uh, Copenhagen. Uh, and during that same time, Typhoon Haiyan hit the Philippines. And it was more powerful than Bopa, which had previously been the most powerful storm. So they didn't find the political will. We're hoping we find it now. Um, this is my daughter, Jane. She's eight years old now. This was uh, three years ago, the first day of spring, when her <laughs> baby sister, Dolly, was born. Um, these are not the storms of our grandchildren like James Hansen wrote about. These are, these are our storms. And uh, the, the exciting thing is everything we need to make these things happen. My children, the, the great thing is that they're net zero babies, right? Pretty soon we'll have more solar on the roof and our, our car will be powered entirely by solar as well. We have all of the tools we need. Um, you sit down with any group of engineers and talk about uh, what a good energy system is and they're gonna tell you it's a network of microgrids. Well, what's the problem? Do we need any more technologies? Is tech are there technology barriers? No. Is it an engineering problem? No. Then what's the problem? It's a human problem. It's a communication problem. It's a regulatory problem. The incentives are all misaligned. This is, these are the problems. These are the hurdles. It's not even a cost problem. It's actually solar is now the cheapest form of energy on Earth and getting cheaper as fossil fuels continue to rise. Uh, this is uh, the Berkeley School in Seattle. It's a net zero water building. It's a net zero energy building. This is the Bullet Center in Seattle. It's a six-story Class A office building in downtown Seattle, Capitol Hill. It goes sidewalk to sidewalk. Um, to give you an idea, uh, you know, if this is Michigan, uh, you travel three hours north, and that's the latitude of Seattle. And they're harvesting 125% of their energy needs for, uh, for a Class A office building that's fully leased. They harvest all of their own rainwater on the, uh, on the roof, all their own water. Any water that's used in the building is harvested on site. There's no sewer pipe. Everything is treated on site to potable standards. They're actually becoming their own water district to get around some of the missing lines incentives because they're still required to put in chlorine into their system as long as they're uh, um, uh, not their own water district. Um, uh, this is the Omega Institute, which actually has a yoga studio that is their sewage treatment plant because they grow bananas and tropical plants inside of it because it's a living machine and all the wastewater that comes from the toilets is actually uh, 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 the final stage of treatment is in, uh, it's in a garden inside um, in upstate New York. Uh, this in Victoria, BC, in Salem, Oregon. Uh, 
Papua New, uh, uh, Pago Pago, New Zealand, San Francisco. Virtually every climate zone on the planet has these buildings. That's the uh, Center for Sustainable Landscapes. Uh, there's uh, the, uh, over here, it's Sunshine Mathan, if any of y'all, he uh, works with a lot of affordable housing stuff. He's an architect here in Austin. He's got a net zero energy home there, which is uh, incredibly comfortable, more comfortable than most homes, and has a negative utility bill. And so I'll just leave you this thought before we get into these things, uh, is that uh, Benoit Menderbrod, you know, how do you get there? How do you build this big system? How do you redesign civilization? And what his fractal math showed was that bottomless wonders spring from simple rules that are just repeated without end. So it's all about just iteration, experimenting, and doing it from the ground up. So, yeah. Thanks, Mr. Grokoff, for your talk. It was really great. Um, <laughs> well, um, so I have a question of what you see the role of uh, governments to be in creating these sustainable microgrids. Is it through communities like the, um, like the one in Ann Arbor that you mentioned, or is it through repurposing um, current homes that we have um, to be more net zero? It, it, it's both. I think, I think we're beyond the point um, of the natural monopoly. It's interesting, the history of how monopoly started. Um, uh, the utilities got their monopoly at a time of unprecedented uh, demonopolization, right? They were going after all the monopolies. And uh, Insul, uh, the guy, I think it was General Electric or Edison or one of the companies that he worked with, uh, he basically argued that, look, we're, we're not a real, we're not a monopoly that's forced to make more profit. We're, we're a natural monopoly. This just makes sense. This is the way nature does it. Is we're, we're, we need to do this and build our system like this. And in exchange for that, you set the price. And what he set up was a system of guaranteed profits for this public good. Um, and at the time, the dominant form of energy transmission was microgrids. Um, you can probably go in downtown Austin and find an old building that says powerhouse somewhere. Um, there were powerhouses all over the place, and, and neighborhood by neighborhood had their own. Um, and sometimes they were connected to each other when one went down and had a little bit more resiliency. But the technology we have today is way, way beyond that. This is the difference between the, uh, you know, the landline to, to the iPhone. Um, uh, the, the, it's even more vast than that, actually. The technology is so vastly improved over these centralized systems. You actually harvest it locally, store it locally. Batteries, um, Tony Seba was talking in, uh, a couple of years ago, a few years ago, about where the price of batteries needed to be and when that would happen. And he was like, 2022 is going to be this point where we cross over and it's going to be more efficient. We're you know, at $100 a uh, kilowatt hour for a battery. Um, uh, it's the ICE, the internal combustion engine, is absolutely dead. There's no, there's no going back. There's no way. You'd have to give away five years' worth of free gas gasoline just to make the purchase of the vehicle on par. Um, we're, uh, they believe Tesla is making these batteries now for $130. So we're like almost at that thing. We're almost a decade ahead of where, um, where they thought it was going to be. So it's happening really rapidly. So to answer your question, I, I, I think it's time to, to end the natural monopolies. And how that happens, I don't know. I, I can only speculate that it's going to be a matter of um, uh, when the, the uh, KB homes and the Pulte homes and the Ikeas and the Home Depots and the universities of the world start saying, wait a minute, we can have our own microgrid and we could actually make money on this. I could actually build a neighborhood and just for the purpose of selling energy to the occupants. It's like I'm basically creating a giant uh, uh, printer and I can just sell you the ink for the rest of your life. Um, those folks are going to start lobbying to get rid of those laws in the same way that Tesla is now saying that the dealership networks are stupid. Um, so that's how I think it's going to happen. My question is about not necessarily dealing with carbon in the atmosphere and trying to diminish it, but dealing with the, with the emergence of the thawing of the methane hydrates. This has happened before with great um, um, detrimental effect to the world globally with some of the largest extinctions. Um, do you think you say the, the melting of the, uh, the methane hydrates, yeah. methane clathrates, the tundra, 
and yeah. this in the in the in the continental shelves. Yeah, the belt um, of methane. And yeah. the amount of methane that could be released is greater than the hydrocarbons and coal that we've consumed over 200 years. Yeah. So it's a very <laughs> large potential. Do you think we should be looking not necessarily at alleviating a carbon uh, problem, but adapting to a alien climate that has never been in our existence? Yeah. I, I, it's, a, it's a great question, and boy, I, 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 that's so above my pay grade. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, Paul Hawken has a wonderful book that just came out this week called Drawdown, uh, and he talks about the, 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 the peat farms and things like that and, um, uh, and trying to protect some of those areas. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, if for, for those of you all who don't know, there's... If the, if the theory is that the tundra melts and all the trapped methane just belches into the atmosphere all at once, and methane is 80 times more potent than CO2 is uh, uh, in the short term for about a 20-year period, so it would be devastating to the climate. It would be a rapid um, uh, shift. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I know like Elon Musk is talking about what to do when things go really, really bad, but um, I, I think right now we focus on uh, what's right in front of us. Again, you know, do it the old-fashioned way. I think all, if we have the technology to uh, harvest water and energy on site, um, uh, the, the, let's figure out what the best scale for that is in, in every location. Um, so doing a net positive water on my house is really stupid, but doing it in my neighborhood would be brilliant because then we can all be sharing the water that's harvested in the little dimple in the earth that is my neighborhood. Um, it's all fl we could work with the rainfall and the gravity, and in times of abundance, we could be using the hell out of water. And in times of scarcity, we'll know it, um, and we'll know how much we have left, um, and we can adapt to that in, in a very easy way. Uh, the governor of California just said that they're out of the drought. It's like, they're not out of the drought. They're in a period of water abundance. So, and if you look at it that way, um, just dealing with it on the adjacent level right in front of us. Okay, um, thank you. So uh, early in the talk, you you mentioned that you did a cost-benefit analysis about the uh, the the projected cost of uh, another developer buying the piece of land uh, yeah. on which you are building a s sustainable community. Um, and then uh, you just mentioned that you know the price of batteries is going down. Solar panels are very inexpensive, and big box stores might uh, see an economic benefit in adapting some of these things. Um, and not do it just because uh, they want to make the world uh, a better place, but just do it because it improves their bottom line. So my question is, is there a call to action here, or are you saying that uh, the market is going to basically take care of this on its own? You, you know, there, there's, there's a, it's funny, if you Google it today, there's just tons of recent articles where there's a lot of people talking about that, that no matter what uh, policies on the on the you know the EIA at the global level or or the Trump administration does that uh, the economics just have shifted so much it's it's like trying to protect the Smith Corona typewriter or or, or Kodak film um, who we were talking about that earlier Kodak used to have the uh, uh, they actually developed digital technology and um, didn't do anything about it um, and they didn't shift. Um, uh, and they were recalled by the manufacturer, in a sense. Um, so that's one place where the market certainly did what it was supposed to do, and other things took over very, very rapidly. It's easy to see in hindsight, um, but the idea is not to try to, you know, pick the winners and losers like the politicians say, but have as many people play in the game as possible so that we can iterate different choices and see which ones work. That's how nature does it. And the more diversity you have, uh, the more likely you are to come up with something successful. The stuff that isn't will go away, and you'll have time to do more stuff. So. I have a question. So you, you touched upon uh, economics of energy and water and how you're trying to become net zero in terms of energy and water. Uh, I want to hear more about how you're trying to do the same with food. So let's say, let's say for example, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're trying to, become, if you're trying to uh, like consume less in terms of food or consume what's growing around you when you're growing decentralized, uh, how, how are you tackling, how are you, how are you planning to... Uh, ooh, that's a good question. Um, uh, so it, you know, energy makes absolute sense from a, from a dollar perspective. Anybody who's got the resources to put solar on the roof should put solar on the roof right now. You, no, in any climate, you're going to make money off of that. Um, uh, water, you know, there's a, you can do it. Um, there's a scaling issue, and there's a, economies of scale. Um, 
food is a whole other thing. Um, you're really reliant on a system outside of your abilities um, unless you have access to that local food. So we're lucky enough to live in an affluent community where some retirees decided to start Argus Farm Stop and create a new model for food distribution that's beyond the um, uh, community-supported agriculture or organics deliveries or farmers selling to Whole Foods or farmers markets even. Um, uh, so by changing, uh, th th to me, this Argus Farm Stop model for um, putting the produce in a place, letting the farmer deliver it, there's very few rules. It's the same thing as in with nature. They don't tell the farmer what price to put on things. They don't tell them how often they should deliver or how much they should deliver. But because it's so small and because it's neighborhood based and because there's 177 competitors that are all mutually benefiting from each other, each one of them is delivering exactly what they know they can produce and sell at that location. And they learn very, very quickly. If it's priced too high, they can lower the price in, in a couple of days. Um, they don't need an algorithm. They just have con customers. If a, if a thing of uh, mushrooms is priced at uh, $4 uh, or, or, or $16 a pound, let's say, and it's like, you know, nobody's buying it because it's $16 a pound. But what you don't realize is that box only contains two ounces. That's not that much. And it's like, wait a minute. If you sell it for, uh, for $6 a pound people will, or $6 a box, people will buy that. And now all of a sudden, you've, it's actually more than $6, $16 a pound, and people are buying it. So you, you get this instant, it's like, just like in nature, because it's so close to the, the resource, to the activity where it's happening, uh, it's close to where it's being grown, it's close to where it's being delivered, it's close to where it's being purchased, it's close to where it's being eaten. <clears throat> because of the adjacency of each one of these things, um, it has this multiplying effect that's ju just like in nature. It quickly corrects, um, it reduces carbon, um, it creates a level of diversi diversity where people are starting to reintroduce local hazelnuts, pawpaw trees, things that you couldn't have before. Um, and, uh, and then coming up with more creative ways of growing things all year round. I mean, can we do hoop houses? So all these innovations are happening at the local level. Um, and, uh, and because you're cutting out distribution centers and everything else, there's much less food waste. Um, uh, there's, it, it's just an extraordinary thing. If you had one of these, if this was the rule, that the only way you could buy food was from a local place, and that place had to figure out where to get its food from, but it couldn't come in an 18-wheeler, um, then they'd have to get it from local farmers, and people would still eat. They always did. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah. so are, are you saying if I'm living in Michigan, Ann Arbor, and I want to try some oranges from Florida, I'll just not eat those or because it no. takes energy to bring it and so. yeah no you could still you can still do that but the thing is you're doing it at a different scale you're not you're not buying um uh you, you, it's okay to buy coffee or chocolate or these other things as long as they're sustainably produced where they are and they're a little bit it's down there on the totem pole um it's not the thing it's not the bulk of your diet same thing with meat one of the things with um with project drawdown when they did the gigatons of carbon uh, globally and then ranked all of these things food and food waste is actually like number three and four on the carbon impact list it's ahead of s rooftop solar for the carbon impact list so having a, um, a mostly plant-based diet actually has a greater impact than putting solar panels on your roof and um, that, that gives you an idea of our food distribution and and, um, and, uh, and production system that we've got um, it's, uh, it's really fragile and dangerous the way it is. Thank you. This one? Hi. Um, when you were, I think you were getting to this with your picture of Venice or uh, wherever it was. Um, <laughs> any old city does yeah, it. Any, it's really any, cool. It's any, old, any old city. Uh, but what about uh, density? So, like, when when you look at like your place, like you can yeah. put solar on your your house and, and provide right. for your energy. But if you're right. doing like a 50 story, and I know the, the six story building yeah. in Seattle is one thing, but like a like take any any uh, condo complex down here, is, uh, it, here is that just yeah. not part of it, or oh, it, what do you yeah, think? density density is huge. But I tell you, so I've been to Austin three times, um, and uh, once in 1992 for the first time population was, I think, 300,000. Uh, 
which was the size of ancient Babylon, by the way. Um, it's still bigger than the city we think so much about. Uh, and then the uh, last time was in 2006. The tallest building, I think, was brand new, was the, the Owl Building, whatever that's called. And, um, and now it's like, holy crap, what the hell happened here? And yet life on the street is worse. I'm sorry if I'm being harsh, but it's, um, uh, I, I, I don't find this greatly improved on the street level. So to answer your question about density, yes, it's absolutely vital. But um, uh, there's only a handful of places where you'll find people who are actually doing the math on density. We, we tend to think that we just go vertical and per square foot matters. But again, that's linear thinking. You, if you look at the, the system as a whole, Austin as a whole, and how much land there is, if we were to lower all those rooftops, think the, so the densest cities in the world, um, or some of the densest cities in the world, the densest areas of these cities, uh, densest areas of San Francisco, Boston, Washington DC, Paris, London, are not their urban downtown centers with the skyscrapers. Those are not the densest areas because there's a lot of space in between those skyscrapers. The densest areas where the most people are living and the most activity is going on is in the lower rise four to eight stories. So that's actually the magic number when you look at all these cities and the land mass and everything else, and then finding ways like um, Verona is like one of the most magical places in the world. Every alleyway, there's not, uh, there's, you have this enough open space where you feel good. Uh, around the city, it's not built up, so there's nothing, there's farms and agriculture, just a bike ride away. Um, uh, we just built a 20-something story building in Ann Arbor, or just approved last week, and everyone's freaking out about it. Um, it's insane. There's so much more space to be building on in Ann Arbor. If, if Paris and, uh, and, and Washington, D.C. can do it without going over six stories, then I think Austin and Ann Arbor can do it too. Um, and that's where your sweet spot of density is. And that's also, um, at eight stories, that's about as high as you can go to where you're going to be able to have a footprint where you can harvest your own energy and water in most places. And again, this is going to be different for every environment, every location that height of the building is going to change. And it will even change neighborhood by neighborhood based on, based on hills, based on adjacent buildings, based on all kinds of things. The height of that building, uh, Seattle actually just um, uh, is offering premiums for um, uh, any building that does uh, uh, living building challenge in their downtown core, right? So one of the things that they get is there's no height limitations if you do a living building challenge building. Right. Good luck building a 40-story net zero energy building. You know, so it's, it's self-limiting. Again, fewer prescriptive rules, more performance-based rules. Nature's rules are always, always, always performance-based because they have to be because they were made from the bottom up, not from the top down. And so when you get rid of, so if cities were to just cut those code books down, Hammurabi had the first building code, and it was if, if, a, if a builder builds a house that falls down and kills somebody, you should be put to death. Um, so that's like, that's a pretty straightforward performance code. There's not a lot to it. It was one paragraph. Uh, and now the plumbing code in Ann Arbor is this thick. And, and it's a total fiction. In Ann Arbor, I can harvest the water from my roof, put it into a tank, called the gray water when it's in the tank. I can then water my lawn with that water, no problem. I can bring it in the house, I can treat it. I can put it through a UV filter. And NSF and any scientific organization, the University of Michigan tests that water and it will be higher quality than the water that's coming out of the tap. And yet that water is classified as gray water. If, if I go right outside the city boundaries and I'm in a rural area, the identical system is called potable water. So it's scientifically potable wherever in the planet you live, but we've created this legal fiction that calls it gray water. So again, if we have more performance-based codes that are much simpler, the living building challenge, if you look at living building challenge versus lead, lead is like this fat and living building challenge is like this. And the reason is, is because um, you want to hear what the energy standard is? I mean, I could, it'll take me about an hour to read the one for lead. Uh, but for Living Building Challenge, it's net positive energy. The building should produce more energy than it consumes without combustion. They added that extra little thing on the end there, without combustion, with on-site renewable energy. So that's like, boom, simple. And you're, and it's, and you're it or you're not. And you don't get certified until after you've proved it.
Going off of the last question, kind of, um, I'm curious if you think in, that in addition to um, in addition to density, there's some kind of geographic component to how um, how scalable the the project that you've developed here in in Ann Arbor is going to be. Like, once you uh, scale out the decentralized model to include multifamily units and warehouses, is it going to be able to succeed somewhere like uh, Detroit, for instance, as well as it would somewhere like Austin from an economic and logistical standpoint? Yeah, again, just like with the metaphor of the flower, it has to be adapted to site. So there's some proposals for the identical site that are much denser, but this is not in the downtown core. So that kind of density doesn't make sense where this project is. So we've tried to kind of figure out what that is and what balances. So it is always adapted to that site and that location. And Living Building Challenge uses what's called uh, transects, and it's based on the concept from the um, uh, Congress of New Urbanism. I think that's who did it, um, or the Land Institute, one of those. Uh, and uh, the idea of transects is, is that it's everything from dense downtown urban cores, like Tokyo, or even there's parts of uh, Austin that would have that. Um, which is like transect six, I think is what it is. And then all the way down to transect one, which is uh, wilderness, wildlife habitat that should never be built on. Uh, and then agriculture, rural areas, suburban, village, downtown core, you know, kind of like that. So there's a, a different scale that you would do at every one of those. But never, I don't think you ever need more than eight stories. Thanks again for excellent. Um, so you're not too far away from Detroit, and it's so interesting with the decline in population. I've heard about some innovative programs for re-ruralification. I'm not sure if that's the right term because they have so many abandoned houses. So are you already working on some interesting ideas to take some of these concepts and yeah. take those areas outside of Detroit that are dilapidated and that are getting torn down and maybe made into Greenfield, but instead do yeah. something innovative like what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Detroit is an extraordinary opportunity. First of all, the Great Lakes, if y'all don't know, have 22% of the world's fresh water supply. Um, uh, but uh, most of the people in that region do not actually get their water from the Great Lakes. They think it's totally abundant and, and that's what it is. So, but Detroit is a great opportunity and it's also a great lesson because it's, it's, it is the perfect idea of how they uh, the, the city, as it was originally formed, had that kind of fractal pattern to it. It was a very small little village. Then they started to design it the way they designed Paris. And again, it had these replicating fractal patterns that you started with one little node and then created another node and another node, and they, and they would scale. Uh, and there's a downtown area called Campus Martius, which has that flow to it. Um, then in the 1920s, starting then, all the way through the 1960s and 70s, you just started chopping it up with highways and everything else. Uh, and then the city grows out of control. It's huge. It's suburban. Um, and then, boom, it, again, linear, top-down, one, no diversity, one industry, industry collapses. And what happens? Now it's smaller than Austin, but it's the size of uh, you know, Boston, New York, Chicago, and San Francisco combined or something like that. There's like four major cities that the land mass of those areas is Detroit. So now it's 700,000 people, down from 2 million. So it was twice the size of Austin, now it's less. So now you have this opportunity where it's, it's the largest urban farming community in the world. No other city in the world has this kind of land in it. Um, uh, when you think about it, it's, kind of, it's amazing. Um, so they have opportunity for stormwater, but there's a lot of mitigation to do. There's lead, there's you know, crumbling pipes. There's a neighborhood called North Corktown, which um, I don't, I'm sure it's the counts are in the dozens of developers. Um, Pharrell was actually looking at this land to bring in a bunch of people and do something. And uh, and then they go and look at the land and they say, "Oh, there's all this empty property. Let's do something." And then it's like, "Well, you, now you got to hook up to the sewer tap." Oh, but the sewer's broken. Oh, now what about? Oh, we're going to hook up to DT, the electricity. Oh, yeah, but you know what? All these transformers and DT is going to make you pay for a whole series of new transformers for the entire neighborhood. Now all of a sudden they have to internalize that cost where anywhere else in the world they build, it's just the infrastructure exists and they just tap into it. Um, man, that's a perfect opportunity for a microgrid, isn't it? Um, but there's a lot of misaligned incentives again. You, it's illegal. Um, you can't, you, 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 you have to be your own utility in order to do that. And to become your own utility, you're a decade in court with Detroit Edison. Um, so there's, there's a lot of barriers, but food is the one that's really coming along because there's no rules. 
you just grow food. And, um, and it's extraordinary. I mean, the for-profits, the non-profits, it's, it's truly becoming one of the best food towns because they're growing it. I mean, there is, I mean, imagine the Owl Building with a farm next to it. I mean, that's really what's happening there. Um, there's a whole neighborhood that's being retrofit. They're going to plant fruit trees and all kinds of stuff on the street. There's a little avenue in the middle. They're going to plant all kinds of stuff. It's edible. Um, I mean, it's extraordinary. There's, there's hoop houses in the middle of the city, right next to the casinos. There's, there's hoop houses and orchards. I mean, it's really, really amazing stuff. So some great stuff is going to happen, but same thing there as everywhere else. Um, we're going to have to realign some of these incentives. And the best thing that Detroit could do is just to kind of let go of its code book. Um, Atlanta did that when they had a crisis, and they basically said, hey, if you want to do one of these rainwater harvesting to potable systems, you can do it. You, you can do it. Um, so they, I mean, it was as simple as that. It was a little tiny code section they plugged in. Um, and I don't think anybody's doing it because they have, it's raining. <laughs> as soon as there's a drought, people will start buying these systems again. So, Just a follow-up question. Uh, back to your individual project where you're talking about 150 homes or you know, residences, but you're basically fighting, not city hall, but county hall in this case, that competitors are coming in, offering more money to the city coffers, perhaps greater tax revenue. What are, can you give us a little insight of some of the stakeholders and the battles you're fighting and where you're finding an opportunity to perhaps succeed if you're not the most profitable in the short term, but perhaps in the long term? Yeah. You know, I'd love to give you like a really technical reason to answer, but the real answer is if we get this project, it's, it's politics and grassroots. That's, that's, that's how we're doing it. Um, what I've learned through this process is apparently the sheriff is the most powerful politician in town. Um, I, I, I'm still not clear why, or just because he's been there the longest or what, but he, um, I, honestly, I have no idea. But everyone's like, if you talk to Jerry Clayton, I'm like, isn't he the sheriff? Yeah, 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 but he's the one that everyone has to answer to. And it's like, what? My elected official has to respond to the sheriff? I, honestly, I have no idea what's going on there. But um, uh, he's got... Um, uh, you know, opioid crisis, and they need money, and there's $2 million sitting on this property, more than what we're offering, and, um, uh, and we have to make the case. And so basically, I'd love to be able to say that we've, we've convinced everyone of full cost accounting, uh, and that even though they're not paying for the carbon, right, you know, $7 million in carbon, well, the, it's not on the county's books, um, or asthma. Well, the coal plant's in Monroe. It's not in Washtenaw County. It's the, those kids are a problem with asthma, not ours. You know, every, every single argument, it's like, well, we're going to have bees and pollination. Nobody cares about the bees. You know, it's, it's, it, there's no, no reason here. It's all this emotional, we're going to make a beautiful neighborhood. It's going to be renewable energy. And we're have, getting close to 1,000 people have signed signatures to support this. And the, the, count, the commissioner who's represented in that district who used to be the chief of staff for John Dingle, very old school kind of politics, just politicking. It's not about doing good. It's just about playing a game. And um, I, I used to work in politics, so when I met him, I just realized, it's like, we're just going to have to make it politically impossible for him to vote no, which means literally having people to go before him and say, oh, you know, when you run for Congress, we're going to campaign against you. That's how we're going to get this land. <laughs> not because somebody figured it out and but but once we have it then we've got tires to kick and they say see this is how you do it this is how a collaboration works we're working with nonprofits to do the affordable housing we're we're doing for profit we're working with the city the city's going to the city will take this over after the county sells this land their planning commission will vote unanimously for it um, uh, they've been desperate to get solar on roofs the pace program you know property sets clean energy um, they've been trying to do that for a long time. Nobody's buying into it because they've got to bond $2 million, but nobody's going to wait till they aggregate $2 million, so everyone just goes and finances it other ways. So all these exciting things are going to happen just like that once the city gets a hold of it, and then all of a sudden it's like, hey, we should do these kind of collaborations again. So we're already starting. I just did a webinar for uh, Chattanooga. They heard about it from somebody in Rhode Island, um, you know, Detroit. You know, we're going to be sitting down with some folks in their sustainability office and because there's lots of land that they want to do something with. Um, and it's like, well, hey, these people need a school. And, hey, there's this huge park, but you know what? We don't need to redo the whole park. We could take this and, and make it something else. And 
What if you did the school and housing and retail all in the same block and we did a microgrid and net zero energy and all this stuff? So stay tuned. I don't know. We don't know if we're going to get this Viridian project, but we'll see. I think we will. That's great talk, Matt. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking Matt for that. <laughs> thank and, uh, you. And, and thank you, Michael and, and Harsh, for, for putting this all together. And our Fred, um, this, is, this is great. And we're going to get drinks and food at Schultz's Beer Garden for the few of you that can join us. Please join us for that. So thank you very much. I think you're wearing the same shirt in your photo the last slide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so funny because I haven't worn this in so long.